It's implemented with a relay attenuator. Um, and in fact, the way, the way we've done it, the dim control and the uh, attenuator, the volume control, actually just have a DC voltage on them. The microprocessor reads it and then decides which relays to turn on. Um, the reason we've done that, we've got main, out one and out two speakers. Main speaker, the level is simply determined by that. And you'll see as I turn it for about one second, the thing that's normally indicating the select channel is indicating level in dB. And as I turn it up, you'll see it goes in 10 dB steps, then 5. And as you get it louder and louder, around here, between 12 and 3, it's 1 dB steps. Because, you know, when you're getting loud, you don't want it to go up in big steps. When you select out 1 or out 2, if you've got two sets of speakers, often they're not going to be matching in level. So you've actually put a power function in the console so that you can actually trim out 1 and out 2 to match main speaker when you switch it so that the level doesn't jump when you flip speakers. Um, and you use, you, there's a cal mode and you use the dim rotary control to do that. The dim gives you 20 dB of adjustment by itself and the cal mode gives you plus or minus 10 with respect to main. The, there's also a 7.1 monitor and um, that's on out 2. If I'm on main and I press 7.1 you'll see it flashing there it's just saying you've got to go to out 2 to get to 7.1. Now when I press it now, you'll see this flashes here momentarily. Normally those are the cut and solo buttons and solo isolate buttons for the group to mix function. When we're in 7.1 mode, those buttons there are actually the buttons that control. We can solo, cut and we can also trim plus or minus 10 dB each of your eight speakers. So not only can we dial them all in with respect to main, but we can individually trim each speaker, all in the console. <coughs> Alex tells me a box to an external box to do that will cost you about five grand. Is that right? At least, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's all in. <coughs> a couple of other little things with the control here. Um, mono, left plus right. That's reasonably obvious. Okay. If I, oh, sorry, I'm just going to leave this. Left cut and right cut. That's also obvious. If I'm in mono, you'll see the left cut is glowing yellow instead of red. When we're in mono and we cut the left or cut the right, instead of cutting the speaker, it cuts the source and feeds the other channel to both speakers. You might notice, you know, if you if you listen to just, you know, if you just want to listen to the right channel, when it's just in the right speaker, you'd prefer if the image was in the middle. So with mono and cut left or cut right, you can do that. One other thing you've got, mono is left plus right. If you press mono and swap, it's left minus right. You can hear the sum and the difference signal just by pressing a button. Input latch mode, that's for the solo. If I press that down, I can solo multiple channels. There's a solo to clear. If input latch is off, you can see I can just solo one channel at a time. Um, solo mode, I said when we've only implemented one mode at the moment. When we implement all of them, there's four choices there. It will just cycle through the four choices. Finally, solo link will link the solos for the channel and the monitor path. So if it's linked, you solo on the channel, it'll cut 63 other signals. This console, depending on the size and options and everything, you're talking $50,000, something, something in that range, depending on which one you get. If you've got a $50,000 console, you don't want a $50,000 automation package. So the way we're planning to implement the automation is using the DAW to store the automation data, probably as some sort of um, MIDI, MIDI control or something like that. It won't be able to just be like MIDI control because that only gives you seven bits, we need at least 10-bit resolution. But we're, we're working through that at the moment. We haven't exactly sorted the fine details, but that's the technology we're going to use. The automation package will be retrofitable for consoles that are purchased before we are ready to, to sell that. So if, if, you know, if you wanted a console, and the automation is not ready, then you can retrofit it when, when, when we've actually got it completed. Would that work with a tape machine automation? No, no it would not. So, okay. Well, you could have the tape machine chase the DAW or vice versa. Yes. Use the DAW as a, basically an automation computer. Yes, absolutely, because I mean, I think, I think it's probably fair to say that everybody these days has got a DAW. And some people have a tape machine, but if you've got the tape machine, you've still got the DAW, so you can, you can just use the computer for that, and it would need to synchronise with the tape, so you'd have to lose one track for time code. But yeah, that would be, that would be feasible.
How many different options are there? Well, it's star eyes. Um, so say it's a 32, how many? Well, you can choose where the master section goes. Remember I mentioned before, it's actually modular in bins of eight channels. You can put that in any bin. It doesn't have to be in the middle. You can order the console like you can order a 32 channel frame and only have 20 channels fitted or something like that. A um, couple, couple of other things. The compressor here will be an option because that's not a cheap thing, that. Um, and if you order the console without a compressor, this panel here will just be blank from here up. And if you later on want to buy the compressor, you just replace that panel and you'll have to screw, screw a couple of transformers into the chassis and just plug them in with little, little plugs. Okay, so it can be retrofitted. Um, the other things that will be optional to the best of my knowledge, this has beautiful rosewood timber top and sides. And I can tell you, because I bought it, it was very expensive timber to buy. Um, and this armrest here is, uh, is true leather. I think that may be an option as well. I'm not certain about that. Um, probably, I'm not sure if the stand's going to be included or option as well, because for smaller consoles like a 16 and possibly a 24 channel, you could quite conceivably put it on a table or something. Bigger consoles, we'll, we'll have to sell. I'm actually not too sure about the exact arrangements for that. As of now, the stand's listed as a separate option. Separate, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is a website where you can look and you, you can actually, config up to 32 channels, you can configure it. It's going to be a little while after the first release, which is expected early next year, before consoles bigger than 32 will be available. I mentioned before about the relay switching for the groups in the master section and the bus impedances and all of that. Because of the bigger console, we actually have to have slightly different impedances on those relay cards and there has to be four more, so the master section is going to be a bit bigger we have actually yet to do all of that work. So that those co bigger consoles will probably be a few months later. They won't be in the first production run. Because we envisage that a, a number of the people will buy this, particularly maybe you know, the 16 and the, maybe the 24 smaller consoles, will be sort of like um, slightly wealthy musicians and will set up a home studio. One thing we have done on this console for both the channel path and the monitor path, there's two line level inputs instead of one. One we call line in, one we call DAW in. So there's two sets of connectors on the back um, of the console for those two inputs. And if you've got a setup where you don't want to have a patch bay or can't afford one just yet or something like that, I personally would always recommend people have a patch bay, but you know, not everyone can, can manage it. You can have your DAW connected to the DAW input, and you've got synth modules or you know other bits of gear like that, keyboards or something, you can plug them to the line input so you don't have to run around the back and keep plugging stuff. You can have it, you know, most of your stuff plugged in. But yeah, if you want to insert something and you haven't got a patch, you are going to have to, okay. there's, there's no way around it. You know? yeah. Patch base is the only way to do that conveniently. Yeah. Okay. One plan we do have, which is obviously not in this console, but it's all drawn up and we're ready to make it, is to have a 19 inch wide bin, we call these groups of eight channels bins, a 19 inch wide bin that can be put at either end of the console, or in both if you want it, where we could actually fit the patch bay with the console. And it's going to be, I think it might mention on the website that if you want a patch bay, like contact us, because all the things like that, it's going to have to be, you know, by quotation, because some people want a simple patch bay and some people want a very comprehensive patch bay, and there's too many variables, so we'll have to take each one as it individually you know, that handle each one individually. But yeah, we do have the ability to put the patch bay at either end of the console. And that could be a little bit of room for a work surface in a producer desk type. Yes, that's something else that was mentioned yesterday. I have to admit, it didn't cross my mind, but we could easily do it. If you want, say, for example, this, you now you can put this here, and this could just be blank. And then you've got a place, because Alex mentioned it, I've got to admit, in Australia, maybe we're a bit backwards. Usually we've got like you know a computer sitting down here and a screen up here. But Alex mentioned some people are actually doing their music recording on their laptop. So you could actually sit your laptop right there in the middle, which would be really convenient. So we're actually, when I get back, we're actually going to make that an additional option where you can just have an eight-channel blank, which will just be a full, you know, full piece of metal or something there, and um, you can put that in. And that means that we have a frame that would be eight more modules wider, one bit wider. Um, still be a 32 channel console in this case, but it will be this much wider and you'd have a blank section there and the master section you could put somewhere 
us. Pro probably that would be the most logical and most people would prefer it there, but your choice. If you're left-handed, you might want it there. It's a no-cost option as to where you, put the, um, where you put the master section. I mentioned it once or twice that we've designed the console for long life and to be easily serviceable. There is a microprocessor in each channel. It actually communicates across the console via a serial bus. It's all fairly modern technology. One thing the microprocessor does, it keeps account of every button press. So it's not a big brother thing, it's just that, you know, after a lot of presses, you know, if the switch starts dipping out, we can look at the, you know, we can look at the, um, the diagnostic and see, oh, well, that switch has been pressed a lot of times, yep, it's time to replace it. Also, if there's anything like a communication error or some other problem like that, that gets logged in the, in the, in the non-volatile memory of the microprocessor and is available for uh, like coming out. How many presses does the switch have? Then? The um, these press switches, I think it's a hundred thousand. But uh, Neve have been using these in. This is the same switch that Neve have been using in all their outboard gear for the last about four or five years. And I know from speaking with the, the two main tech guys at the factory in, in Burnley that they've had virtually no problems. I won't say zero, but very low. Anyone tells you that something like this is going to be totally reliable and will never break down is telling you a lie and don't ever buy a console from them. This will break down inevitably because when you've got that much electronics, it's just it's simple physics. Something will fail. Um, what sets the console, you know, what differentiates one thing from another is when it breaks down, not if, but when, that it's easy to fix, that it's able to be fixed, or that you can get an exchange module or something like that. On that, the plan for this, because the console comes with a one-year parts and labour warranty and a five-year parts warranty. So the basic, the, the bottom line of that for, for you as a possible customer, if something breaks down in your warranty period, say a channel, something goes wrong in a channel, we will send you one, or probably here in the North America, Vintage King will send you a brand new channel if it's in warranty. You can put that in and you send the old one back and there's no cost. You might have to pay $20 postage or something, but that's it. There's, no, there's nothing out of pocket. Um, if it's out of warranty, there'll be an exchange module arranged where it'll probably be a refurbished module if it's out of warranty and there'll be a cost. We'll have to work out what the cost will be. We're not planning to make big bucks out of service. Service should be service, it should not be profit. Um, uh, and uh, we'll have, we make sure the Vintage King, there's about 20 different assemblies in this console in total. We make sure that they have every assembly so that if there is a failure, that they can quickly send you one and get you up and running you know, in short and whatever. You probably notice the channels that went round is surface mount technology. A lot of technicians don't feel comfortable for that. We've used with repairing that. So I think most people will actually avail themselves of the exchange, you know, the exchange uh, return system. Um, but for those that want to service it themselves, we're happy to give out the schematics and stuff like that. Um, one thing you didn't see in the channel is the output transformer. Probably a few people spotted that. The reason is it doesn't fit in the channel because they're just a bit wider. They're in the frame. And if you don't believe me that they're there, just try and lift the back of the console. <laughs> You'll agree very soon there's output transformers. Okay. If you want something special, just ask us. It's relatively easy. One good thing about manufacturing in Australia, which is where this will be made, is that <coughs> Australia is actually the most economical country in the world to do low volume production. Now, low volume doesn't mean ones and twos, it means tens and hundreds, which is the sort of quantities we're talking about with a mix with a professional mixing console. We've got all the technology I mentioned, you know, we've used laser engraving on the channels and everything like that. We've got all that technology here in this book, back in Australia. If someone needs something custom, we can do it fairly economically. So it's not like serious, serious dollars to get something specially made to your requirements.